Welcome. My name is Gina Timberman, and you are listening to Timber People, a podcast about people who, like Timber, are strong, build and create, who gather us together like fuel that feeds fire. People who support structures of our community that uplift and protect. Hello and welcome. I'm so happy and honored that my friend Philip Busey Jr. of Delaware Resource Group uh, is is joining me today on the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, Philip is the Executive Vice President and President of Commercial Entities for DRG. And I, I, I see you, I've known you over the years, and it's really wonderful to have the opportunity just to sit down in studio and have a, a really good conversation about all the work that your company is accomplishing locally, but globally. Well, thank you. I, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thanks for thinking of me. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you're from Oklahoma City, yes. uh, born and raised. Yep. And uh, your wife and kids, we were just talking about your family is so much fun. And I've known your dad uh, for many years, too, and I've known about his great work and your company's great work. And so I really appreciate the role that you play in business in our community and who you are in our community as a family, but also in Indian country. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're very passionate about uh, being here in Oklahoma City, uh, based in Oklahoma City, and uh, you know, seeing what we can do to make a difference in the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know you did some work in Washington D.C. How was that? Uh, that was that was a long time ago. That was I did um, two internship programs uh, while I was uh, in getting my undergrad at Southwestern Oklahoma State uh, University in Weatherford. And it, that was through American University. It was called the WINS program, the Washington Internship for Native Students. And uh, it, it's no longer, unfortunately, uh, no longer a program, but it uh, really focused on teaching natives across the United States, A, to have an internship, a valuable internship with the federal government in Washington, D.C., getting an understanding of how the federal government operates at a you know, one-on-one -on -one level. Um, and then also American University uh, really put the curriculum out there focusing on tribal sovereignty and, um, you know, what's it like working for the federal government and, and, with, and uh, with the federal government. Um, it taught me uh, the importance of tribal sovereignty. And I, I think, uh, unfortunately, that program is no longer uh, available, but it really has uh, continued, even though the last time I did that internship was 2005, it has always stuck with me on uh, how important tribal sovereignty is for our, our the nations, uh, the citizens of those nations, uh, because it's, it, it, it can go away. It's I feel like uh, it's constantly under threat at, for some degree. I've noticed, uh, particularly in Oklahoma, you know, the the last several years, um, you know, the uh, the tribes have done a wonderful job of sharing their message positively, the impact that they're making in Oklahoma, but um, you know, it's under threat at the at both at, at the state level, particularly, and it's. Uh, it's scary, but a lot of it, I believe, is rooted in the fact of the unknown, uh, not not knowing the importance that tribal sovereignty has, and uh, how you know it's a valuable asset that tribes need to keep, maintain, and protect. It is tribal sovereignty is a mystery to so many people. Um, many think of it just as a, an aspect of our cultural identity. When in fact it's very much rooted in um, who we are um, from our origins, but also our political identities, past and present. And I wanted to mention you know, your experience in Washington D.C. I participated when I was in law school at the University of Oklahoma in a similar program at the Department of Justice, and. I wanted to bring it up because of the work that your company um, does throughout Indian country. And for me and my work, it was really important 
to be up in D.C. to see how the wheels turn and how everything is interconnected. It's like this big spider web of policy, advocacy, communities, how, you know, something that happens you know, at, at the highest levels of government are all connected to our communities throughout Indian country, and it makes a major impact. And like you said, it, it, can, it can go away. It's important that we keep our, our swords um, and our shields, primarily our shields, um, really um, close to us for our protection for our tribal sovereignty. Yes, I, I really think uh, you're absolutely right. And the, it, you know, our tribal leaders, I believe we're very fortunate in Oklahoma right now. Uh, if you look across um, the, the tribal nations within Oklahoma, the, the leadership is absolutely amazing who the citizens of those nations have been able to elect and, and groom. Uh, I think we're very in a very fortunate spot, but um, that education needs to continue, uh, not just to the leaders on what is sovereignty, the legal backing behind it, um, its intent, the original intent, the intent going forward, but also everybody needs to be educated about it because those that don't know about it, they see it as a threat. Um, and I think that that's what we've seen. Uh, there's been a lot of, um, you know, the, you know, elected officials or people that push policy, they don't know uh, what sovereignty is. And that can, that's where the danger lies. Um, and, and if we can continue to educate um, the importance, the, the tribal history that, that has gone on uh, related to sovereignty, um, I think um, that, that's, that's what we have. That's what, you know, to protect and it protects Oklahoma too. You know the nations are so powerful in this state, um, and that that in itself is also just like sovereignty. It's not a threat; uh, it's opportunity, and it's something that uh, no other state in the United States has uh, the same way. And uh, I really believe that if everybody, uh, regardless of political position, if they understood the background better of what roles the tribes have, uh, where, where they've gone, where they've been, um, and, and the sovereignty, the opportunities that uh, could be far greater for the entire state, um, the economic engines uh, that those uh, place. Uh, to me, I believe we all see the trends in what's going on in rural uh, America, the decrease in population, the um, you know migration to larger cities, larger cities getting bigger and bigger, but the tribes, you know, the tribes have their home and uh, th that can be something unique to Oklahoma is strengthening, continuing to strengthen rural Oklahoma and uh, allowing them to be the economic engines uh, that they can be uh, because they get, you know, tribes are, if you look at the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, my, my goodness, they're in everything. <laughs> and uh, in a very good way, the differences that they make, the you know, the, it's a there's the businesses that they have uh, really provide those profits. The businesses are run well. Uh, the profits then go uh, back to the citizens. Um, it, it's the, and the communities, and it's just a it's a win win. And I wish uh, to see more partnership at the particularly the state level uh, and recognizing the value that they that they bring. Absolutely, someone said one time, if you take you know, one piece of river cane, you can just snap it in half. But if you take a bundle, you can't break it. Right. And I really think uh, that really resonates what you're saying about that the strength and partnership, strength and knowledge, strength in entities, native and non-native alike, coming together and understanding yeah. what the potential is there. You have in rural Oklahoma, as you mentioned, you have some of the largest employers are the tribes and keep those economies alive diversify our areas of economic development. And I want to talk um, a little bit about that in a minute, but you know, really what tribes are providing throughout the state, many of the roads that you drive on, health care that, you know, really the opportunities of health care that benefit entire families when you may have 
just a, a you know a few people in the family that are tribal members even with some areas yeah. and social services education um, Choctaw Nation is you know, providing foster care training in the community and opportunities and services for law enforcement like other tribes and really um, the economic impact is is incredible it really is if you t look at it as a from a I like to look at it as a business analogy like let's take a fortune 500 company um, you know that's driven to produce um, you know value to the shareholders and but let's take that let's 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 say a tribe like the Choctaw the Chickasaws or the Cherokee if you look at their annual revenue as a whole let's take a fortune 500 company and plop it down in rural Oklahoma that's what's happened but what's better is the shareholders are the citizens and the right. people that reside in the community so it's like it's it's like fortune 500 company on steroids it, and for the greater good it's truly a, a, an amazing opportunity and uh I, I don't know i i i just wish that uh um that taking that mindset and really uh you know driving home as far as all oklahomans realizing that the value that they that they bring uh, it's just impressive Absolutely. Now you're Cherokee and Delaware. Yes. And I know that you have a strong heritage in um, in Indian country in the business world with your business and with your family and what you contribute your time to historically and today with arts and culture and community. Um, when you think about your advocacy for the whole, it's also really important because it's people say in business, don't take it personally. You know, when things oh, happen. I hate that term. <laughs> like it's for not... Native people, it's really, you know, it is personal. It is, yeah. There's so, no what does it thing. mean for you thinking of, you know, your family and I know your family and your your little ones, you know, that that your advocacy is paving that, you know, the pathway for their future and for the reception of the work that, that, potentially they will be doing in the environment they will be in, whether it's in Oklahoma or across Indian country. You know, what does that mean to you, for you? It's important. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's critical. Uh, you know, it's very important that, um, you know, I know, you know, I take a lot from my father who is, um, you know, is still very much involved in our business uh, today. Uh, he founded DRG over 20 years ago. And, but he has always been an advocate in Indian country. He's, uh, you know, his reputation is um, still today everywhere I go there. You know, I'm always, you know, I, I am, I am my own person, but I am also uh, usually a lot of people are, oh, you're, you're Phil Busey's son. <laughs> yes. One of uh, one of them. <laughs> but um, I, I think I've taken a lot of uh, what he has done and seen, witnessed uh, the efforts that he's made um, to better Oklahoma and to better uh, Indian country and uh, want to definitely carry on that legacy. And, and my hopes is, you know, my children see that right. and maybe they'll, they'll, they'll do the same. Um, you know, we, we all need to um, do good in the world and make it a better place. And uh, I, I believe that, um, you know, do, making efforts, uh, positive gains in Indian country is just one way that uh, we can help. Absolutely. And it's awesome that you have a sphere of influence within your family for making those gains. And you partner with other entities that are spheres of influence. And I think mm -hmm. it, in Indian country and beyond, it's really about connecting those spheres of influence to make big impacts. I know that you have a program um, a Native American um, Partnership Incentive Program, where you partner to maximize the opportunities for um, business development for um, for you know an American Indian owned business. I think that's so important to have programs like that because um, we're diversifying our economy. We're really um, we're we're playing on a different stage together. 
And I think it's really exciting. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, you know, one of the things we really honed in on is, well, a couple of them uh, where, you know, we are a aerospace and defense contractor is our, is our, is our business. And um, in addition to Indian country, um, you know, the aerospace and defense industry, the aerospace industry itself is the second largest industry in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, it wasn't that way just a few years ago. It's, it's growing r at a rapid pace. Uh, one day it will, it will, in the very short term, it will surpass oil and gas. The one thing that is hindering its growth is, is workforce is the people, the talented people to go into um, the aerospace industry. And so where we feel very passionate about is the fact that there's an opportunity in Indian country. Um, right now, you know, the, right now the need is so great. There's been, there's a lot of efforts to recruit talent to Oklahoma, convincing people from, uh, you know, California move here, work here. Um, it's great, you know, but our, the long term, you can only do that so long. Um, I don't, you know, let's, I mean, can you ask yourself in 20 years, are you still going to be recruiting people from out of state to come work and fill these high quality jobs? Well, guess what? Oklahoma has these tribes that have citizens here. Um, they're not at, you know, when you relocate somebody, the chances of them moving back or not having that, that, that thing, that, that family or, you know, the, the other tangibles that really hold them and root them here, uh, they're more likely, okay, they'll take a job here and then they'll move on somewhere else. Well, here in Oklahoma, we've got, you know, growth from within. And so um, we we do our part. We partnered with the Cherokee Nation uh uh, we uh, help them with their case program, and that is educating um, students about the aerospace industry. And our hope is that enough people get interested in the aerospace industry that they choose to go in to uh, seek employment uh, when they uh, graduate high school or decide what career path it, within aerospace they need, and so they go get that education and then come back to Oklahoma or work, be contributors into, in the aerospace industry within Oklahoma. And uh, I think that that has been one of the very important things that we um, can do. It's, it's certainly scalable. Um, and we're just doing it with the, you know, with the Cherokee Nation. That's, you know, our home, our home tribe. I really appreciate your dedication to implementing um, the intention of workforce development in our educational systems. It's so important. I see it in, you know, tribal historic preservation issues, museum studies, um, in many aspects. What worked 30 years ago is will not work for our future. No. And especially with the technologies that we have now, the opportunities, professions, the, we have to be intentional in um, how we're guiding, educating, and empowering young people to lead, to employ cultural values mm -hmm. in their ways of life at home and at work, and also to be mindful of, I mean, when I was growing up, I thought, well, maybe I could be a secretary or a, you know, it, I didn't know much about workforce. I knew, you know, what my, my mother did or, um, thank God I've worked with some incredible people that are um, in the workforce with different positions. Um, but I didn't know much about, I didn't know anything about aerospace. I didn't know, and my mom went into working with the, for the FAA, so there's some irony there. But it's really interesting. I didn't really, when my teacher asked me what I wanted to be, I, I reeled off like three teacher uh, you know, a couple of, and I didn't, now today, the opportunities are endless. There's so many different um, opportunities that we have. Yeah. And it's all here too. I mean, I, when I was uh, getting my undergrad, 
um, well, even in high school, everybody was getting their, you know, if you're going to go get a job, you know, you're going to go to Dallas. Uh, everybody was looking south. Right. <laughs> and uh, in, in college was the same way. I mean, I, I even took a tour of uh, businesses in Dallas. <laughs> it was um, uh, while I was studying, uh, you know, the university took me out there and it was, um, um, but I, I was one of those, you know, I'm going to stay here, you know, obviously, yeah. um, and uh, Oklahoma's home. And, uh, now, uh, you look at what, I mean, the, it, the tides have turned. I mean, the opportunities are all here. You can go to school here in Oklahoma right. and get a job here in Oklahoma. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. And that makes, you know, us that have been born and raised in generations right. of Oklahomans, that's, uh, there's a lot of comfort in that and, uh, both, you know, economic security, but then also the fact that the, you know, people will stay here and right. uh, it's a great place to live, raise a family. And, uh, I, I hope that the, uh, I hope that that just continues, but. Absolutely. Oklahoma really has all of the pieces here. Um, we have the opportunities for our economy. We have the opportunities for education, if we can get intentional. We have the cultural opportunities for enjoyable um, quality of life. I really loved exploring your website and from the business development perspective and recruitment, when you list out you know, recommendations for date nights and restaurants you enjoy. And that's so important because, you know, people really want to know if they're, you know, going to work somewhere, are they going to enjoy their life outside of work? And, yeah. uh, and culturally, I, I love that you're involved in arts and culture and different organizations, but that's about your quality of life and, and people want their families to be a part of that. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's part of the recruiting. You know, you recruit people, which we're ha having to do in the short term, you know, all aerospace companies uh, are having to do that. And you really have to tell the story about what a great place this is. Uh, there is, but yes, I'm involved in uh, several organizations, the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, uh, Oklahoma Contemporary and, and of course, the Civic Center Foundation. I mean, uh, and the reason I'm involved in those programs is in those organizations is because I believe um, in what they're doing. I mean, the first class, high quality arts um, that we uh, have access to in Oklahoma is truly remarkable. And it's growing. I mean, now with, you know, if you look what uh, First Americans Museum has done just in the last few years um, in getting going. And now with uh, the investments that the Chickasaw Nations have, Chickasaw Nation has put in and putting into that area around that museum, uh, it's going to be a destination. Um, but the, ar the arts, you know, if you look at the exhibits that we have, the artists that um, are showcased, um, it's really remarkable. Um, what what's happened uh, on the art scene uh, but yes to, to go back on the education and being intentional it's you know it, it we have to be intentional uh it cannot i i i see in the short term uh, a lot of uh, divisiveness uh, you know politics getting into education and that's not i don't think that that's where we need to be headed uh in the state because the, I mean, if you look, uh, if, if we get, take politics out and just do the right thing, right. Um, you know, most people, I, I, everybody I know wants to better education. Um, and so let's, let's take it to that level and, uh, and see how we can ensure that teachers are properly paid, um, that the resources that are making it to the classroom uh, are, and are, are valuable. Um, you know, ensure that um, all Oklahomans develop good critical thinking skills. Um, and, uh, you know, that I think if we did that and focused um, as a, in a, in a, you know, non-political way, uh, I really think that uh, Oklahoma will be better. That the tools that, that, our edu that we have in Oklahoma 
for education are really amazing. I mean, if you look at the uh, from the school systems, but then also uh, and the opportunities that those school systems have, um, you look at the higher ed. Uh, I'm, I really love our regional university model that we have. And maybe I'm biased because I went, I got my undergrad at Southwestern out in Weatherford. But, you know, it's a, um, that, that model there in, in getting, allowing all Oklahomans to seek higher education opportunities uh, is really valuable. And I would love to see more investment into higher ed um, and, and into those regional universities, um, the value that those have. And as part, as, part of the, um, the whole growing from within uh, model uh, that we've touched on earlier. When you look at Oklahoma and, and the people that come up, in, particularly in rural areas, um, giving them an education like at Southwestern or North, uh, Northeastern or Southeastern, any of those regional universities, um, they're more likely to, you know, those people are, you know, they're hardworking people. Um, and giving them the opportunity to go seek out an education there and then that can be the pipeline for uh, work in Oklahoma. It's it's, it's not a uh, a lot of people. The trends I know with Southwestern, I'm involved heavily uh, with that university, and and we are actually sponsor a workforce development program with Southwestern uh, for the aerospace and defense industry. And it really has um, you know most of the people that graduate from those regional universities stay in Oklahoma. It's it's not a uh, uh, brain drain where you have universities uh, that, you know, people graduate and then they move out. Um, if you look at regional, uh, I'm, it's in excess of 80% of those that graduate from regional universities in Oklahoma stay in Oklahoma. And that needs to be really considered when it comes to um, uh, the workforce um, challenges we currently face, but then the opportunities that are ahead. Absolutely. With the soft skills, as well as in, you know, in workforce development, regional universities, and even um, the technical colleges um, for developing um, the trade skills and soft skills for overall workforce development. I'll say with the regional universities, what I have seen are incredible partnerships with the museums throughout rural Oklahoma, yeah. as well as with the tribes. Yes. And years ago, we had a program called Braided Paths that was really um, sponsored by the um, the Humanities Council, uh -huh. Oklahoma Humanities Council, to go out and to share stories of our braided paths of, of tribes and people in the communities and partnerships and we partnered up with different universities and the state to have a forum for sharing stories and connecting with the communities. And it's just always been such a, a, a great experience being out and working throughout rural Oklahoma with our regional universities. So I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, well, I, I've got to, I, I have to say that working with Southwestern on the business side, I have not seen a university that has been so adaptive to the workforce needs. Um, when you look at what Southwestern has done just in the last year, uh, when it comes to the workforce development uh, initiatives focused on aerospace and defense, they, they, they have adapted and changed so quickly. It should give everybody optimism uh, when it comes to uh, growing the local uh, talent for the aerospace and defense industry. Uh, they are partnering with businesses and uh, have, you know, asked businesses, what do you need? And, uh, and, and listened and, and even when in putting that listening into action. And i I wish all universities need to take a look at what Southwestern has done uh, when it comes to adapting to meet the, the demands of industry, because that's, to me, that's going to be the solution 
uh, going forward, particularly in the aerospace and defense industry. They've already have a rich history of supporting uh, the aerospace and defense, but going forward, they're going to be at the forefront uh, for a long time. And they do that because of their adaptability and, and giving businesses and, and federal agencies what's needed. And I wish um, that, you know, at the state level, uh, with it being a state university, um, you know, state officials looking at that and, and considering more funding and more uh, opportunity. Obviously, they have the secret sauce, uh, at least at the initial stage, and and uh, and helping them get more, and that it's only going to make Oklahoma better. And you really, you know, it's about the investment. You know, you mentioned about the brain drain, and that yeah. they have that 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 secret sauce. It's about investing in our heritage, in who we are, and the communities making investments that only support their local w workforce and keep people there. And then their children, people's children, their grandchildren. It's about that heritage that's so important. And yeah. it's about that pride too, that pride of feeling connected. And we as native people, we as tribal people, we as humans really need that connection mm -hmm. and um, staying connected to those communities that are familiar, are friendly, are places where we can grow. You know, I say on this podcast, Timber, but if you look at those rings of a tree, you can see where it's grown. Looking at Weatherford and other areas throughout the state, um, Durant and Ada, everywhere. I mean, I can, I can go on and name so many different communities that have seen that growth. Yeah. You know, Miami, Oklahoma, you know, up in the Northeast and all over the state. And um, it's about that investment. It's yeah. about that investment. And there was a quote once that it was, it's, there are two types of people in the world, the yes, if people and the no, because people. So it's, <laughs> one is just about a state of mind of, no, we just can't be, you know, and, and so a lot of times, unfortunately, it's about politics, but, and it's that yes, if, yes, if we can be intentional, yes, if we can make the investment, yes, if we can do it the right way right. and in a good way then so many opportunities will open up for those rings of growth. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, you know, to touch on also, you know, the economic engines of Oklahoma, I believe are centered on the regional universities and the tribes. Absolutely. So, I don't know. I, that could be for another day. <laughs> we right, could, right. I could probably talk, uh, talk forever on the topic. But higher education, you know, linking that intention to, it is about connecting the spheres of influence with higher education, with high school, with the tribes, with our cities, our communities. We really can connect those spheres of influence, you know, in our music. Really, we can connect the spheres of influence and in drawing upon the resources we have around us, like our museums, like you know, our elders in our communities, like you know, really our mentors and others and taking from, you know, what we've learned in places from our internships. It's, that's where things come full circle. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really where things come full circle. You're like a renaissance man. <laughs> you have this diverse history in business and aerospace. And you have a beautiful book that you handed me about Heritage Hills and um, that you were the photo your photography is featured yes. in this book with the foreword by my friend John Michael Williams. Yes. And I am just so excited to spend some time with this beautiful book. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, well, my, my work outside of business is obviously my family uh, and uh, my wife and two boys and our two dogs, but it is also photography. That's my, my gateway. Um, or get away. And uh, I enjoy taking pictures. I did that in college uh, when uh, during my first internship to, to Washington, D.C. I was intentional on uh, taking photographs of in and around Washington, D.C. to really uh, preserve those memories. Uh, I, my photographs at the time, you know, they didn't include any people. It was more architecture and uh, and and uh, you know, cityscape type. And uh, that ended up 
I, when I took those pictures, I brought them back and showed them my, I was studying art in, in my undergrad and I showed my art professor some of the photos I took and she was very impressed and, uh, and encouraged me and had me have an art show at the university. And, uh, the first, one of the first undergrads to have low, and I was a, you know, sophomore, not a senior, to have a solo exhibit in the main gallery at the university. And uh, uh, I called it Souls of the Nation. And um, I, I, that work was very well received. And it, it got me uh, offers from the, the student paper, <laughs> wanting a photographer, the public relations office at the university, wanting a photographer. And then, of, of course, the Weatherford Daily News, uh, wanting a photographer. <laughs> Uh, and me, um, you know, needing money and, um, you know, seeing the opportunity, I, I, I said yes to all three. And uh, so I, I did a lot of uh, sports photography, um, you know, the, the, you know, the typical public relations um, shots of, uh, you know, people shaking hands, handing checks to people and, uh, you know, smiling faces, and then documenting things that were going on, on campus. And, um, it was a lot of fun, uh, but it was a lot of work. I, I met my, my now wife, uh, in college and, uh, got engaged while getting my undergrad and then decided to get married while getting my undergrad. It was a lot of work. Um, I knew you were a warrior, but <laughs> some warrior ways there. <laughs> and by that time, not only was I taking pictures, but I was the sports editor for the weather for daily news. Uh, I had climbed the ranks at the, at the uh, student paper uh, became was the editor in chief and relinquished that to to my good friend uh, Lexi Smith, who's now uh, doing uh, marketing and advertising here locally in Oklahoma City. And um, anyway, it, it became overwhelming, and uh, so I put the camera down. And uh, there was a period of where I didn't even think of photography, and uh, then. There was, uh, let's see, we're going on almost 10 years now. Um, my wife was pregnant with our, uh, with Griffin, my, uh, oldest son. And, uh, we were, we were trying to knock out a bunch of travel and, uh, we had, uh, the, one of the last ventures before actually we we're going to go to New York, we came back, we we're going to go to the Europe, uh, to England. And then come back for a week and go to uh, go to New York. On the flight back from London, uh, I had developed um, what ended up being four uh, pulmonary embolisms and two in each lung, and uh, a pretty extensive bl blood clot in my leg. And uh, so, being young and uh, you know, I obviously lived through that. Um, but when you have doctors that tell you, you know, you <laughs> had you gone to bed that night, you would not have survived. And uh, so it, it shakes a, uh, really brings forth, uh, you know, what your mortality is. And, uh, but it was also depressing. But my wife, uh, at the time, you know, she studied mental health and uh, she really encouraged me to pick up the camera. So whenever I was, you know, feeling down or, uh, you know, really struggling, uh, she encouraged me, you know, focus, look through that lens again. And, and I did. And uh, I started taking pictures obsessively. And uh, it just, from there, I mean, this is where I, I carry a camera with me every day and uh, enjoy shooting. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a lot of the pictures are, you know, my personal, I do put some out there uh, on social media. I take a lot of pictures of my kids, may annoy them. Um, it's no longer, uh, I, I, you know, we've, we've, you know, I moved on, uh, from, uh, you know, the, the health issues and, uh, and now it's, it's something that just stuck with me. It's, it's now I, I take pictures solely because I enjoy taking pictures and, um, yeah, I, I'm glad that other people appreciate my work. Uh, you can, uh, it's sold at the, some, some of my work is sold at the Museum of Art. Uh, in their bookstore, and then uh, same with Exhibit C Gallery in Bricktown, uh, which is uh, owned by the Chickasaw Nation. 
They um, actually have an art show that's being featured at, at right now of some photographs that I took of um, my wife's family and my family, uh, artifacts that we've had that have been handed down uh, that have a lot of uh, tribal influence um, uh, in them. And, and you can see that in the artwork. I used a macro lens for that. And uh, anyway, I think it's beautiful over there uh, if you don't, if you get a chance to go look at it. But, um, but yeah, then that led me to, you know, there's that book there that uh, is sold through Historic Preservation to raise money for Heritage Hills uh, and their historic preservation efforts and beautification of the, the parks and so forth around there. And so anyway, but yeah, I, I love photography. Thank you for sharing the book with me. Thank you for your support of our communities and our parks and appreciate your support. You and your family support of the First Americans Museum. And yes. I want to say thank you for, uh, to you for your photography and for Heather encouraging you yes. to pick up that camera again. And I want to thank you for just sharing your experiences and um, our conversation today. Thank you so much, Philip. Yes. I appreciate you. Well, Wado. Thank, you. thank <laughs> you for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. Yakoki, thank you for joining us. Timber People is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform.